So um, yes, more often than not, when somebody says performance, we tend to think about speed. But even though being not exactly the same, this substitution has a really good background in forms of uh, statistics. For example, Walmart.com figured out that one second of performance improvement will give them 2% higher conversions rate. Doesn't sound that much, but we are talking about a company with 482 billion US dollars in revenue. And let me tell you that 2% of this number can buy you 10 countries like Samoa Islands. That's quite a lot of money. Another perspective on performance, uh, recent redesign by Financial Times revealed that one second drop in performance will leave them without 4.6% of conversions. Drop in two seconds will leave them without 5% of conversions. And three seconds of losing performance would steal almost 8% of conversions rate from them. That's a lot of users. But probably the best perspective on performance gave Wikipedia last year when they were searching for web performance engineer. They simply calculated the number of readers that Wikipedia has and put it this way, that by cutting page load by 100 milliseconds, you would save Wikipedia readers 617 years of wait annually. This is quite unexpected, but very illustrative case of what is performance. These statistics answers the question, why performance matters. Users buy more, users click more, users download more. And that's pretty much all I wanted to tell you about why performance matters today. Thank you. <laughs> well, you didn't think that I would leave just like that, did you? Huh? Uh, if things are that simple, why do we keep talking about this performance thing? And if performance is solely about speed, then how do we explain this? This is statistics for gizmodo.com. And if we get to the numbers, well, that's quite shocking. Load time, almost 20 seconds. Visually complete, 20 seconds. And this is on the cable connection. There has to be something wrong with these statistics. Because gizmodo.com is the site that during the last 30 days gained more than 33 million unique users and more than 112 million views. Okay, statistics apart, let's see how this site behaves in the real browser. We type in the URL, and this site is almost instantly here. Where are those 20 seconds, huh? We'll get back to this example a bit later. But to those of you who still think that performance is about milliseconds, kilobytes, number of server, server requests, I have a news for you. Performance is not about mathematics. Performance is about perception. And that's why today I'm not going to tell you how to super, superpower your page loading time by using some fancy uh, tools and techniques like Service Worker, because, well, nobody can tell you this better than Jake. Hello, I'm Jake. Hello, Jake. <laughs> Instead, I will give you a different perspective on what we call performance. And in this journey today, we will employ the most powerful and interesting tool that we have at our disposal, our brain. Have you ever had this experience when you spent days, weeks, working on your performance optimization strategy? You deploy everything, but neither your customer nor your boss notices any difference. You know that times are lower. You know that performance optimization works. But your users, well, your users just don't care. In 19th century, German psychologist Ernst Weber and later his uh, student Gustav Fachner postulated a law that, surprisingly enough, they called weber fachner law. Uh, this law defines a value called just noticeable difference. This is n minimal noticeable difference between two stimuli, like power, difference in power, difference in power of light. And time is no exception to this law. 
But experience and research show that for the short periods of time of up to 30 seconds, and these are the times that we are particularly interested in when we talk about the web development, uh, weber fachner law can be replaced with simple 20% rule. Why am I talking about this? And what does it have to do with us web developers? Well, let's assume you have an event that your customer is not satisfied with. For example, page loading time. So in order for your customer to just notice the difference after your performance optimizations, you, may, you have to make your page loading at least 20% faster. Anything below that will make your users thinking, oh well, I don't see any difference. There is one catch though. We are talking about noticeable difference. And noticeable does not necessarily mean meaningful. If you still think that 20% is more than enough to spot the difference, then I have another example for you. I will show you two versions of the same page. One without optimization and one with optimization. Your task is to spot which one is faster. Are you ready? Are you ready? Yeah. Great. Site number one. Site number two. Who thinks that site number one was faster? Okay. Who thinks that site number two was faster? Wonderful. Who thinks that this is matrix and this site doesn't exist? <laughs> That's correct. Um, you see that there are people who think that first option is faster, and there are people who think that the second option is faster. Technically, there is no correct answer, but if we check the numbers, the first one was, load, was taking 1.6 seconds to load, and the second one used 2 seconds to load. And the majority of you told that second option is faster. Do you still believe in absolute numbers? In this example, we are talking not about 50 milliseconds difference, not 100 milliseconds difference. We are talking about 400 milliseconds of difference. And if you still think that we can blindly rely on absolute numbers, here is my second example to you. Hello, I'm Jake. Sorry, Jake, I just couldn't resist. Of course, I'm Dennis. And I hope that all of you have wonderful conference so far and my voice doesn't make things worse, even though I deliberately delayed the audio on this clip by 100 milliseconds. You just won't notice anyway, because our brain is really good at synchronizing the information it gets from five of our senses into one consistent perception to compensate for any delays, unless the delays become disproportionate. And in this case, we experience this annoying out-of-sync video. Your turn, buddy. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. Our brain is cheating us. Our brain does not allow us to rely on absolute numbers. Now, remember all those days and weeks you've spent on your performance optimization strategies to just shave off 50 milliseconds. And your users just don't notice. Of course, one can argue that 50 milliseconds there and 50 milliseconds there in total can give quite significant uh, performance improvement. And I do agree. The problem is that all of these performance optimizations require development time that your users might not be willing to give you. So far, what I'm talking about today is quite depressive, isn't it? Eh? But you know what? Let's try to turn our depression into the opportunities. Since we're talking about performance and perception, let's figure out how our brain perceives time, and in particular, how brain perceives weight. First of all, pretty much any event consists of two phases, active phase and passive phase. Active phase is characterized by mental activity. 
It can be mental activity of any kind, like pure mental activity or mental activity related to some physical activity. But the point is, your brain is busy. On the other hand, the passive phase is characterized by idling. Your brain has no other option rather than just sit and wait. Well, you sit and brain waits. Um, using some techniques, we can manipulate this balance between active phase and passive phase in order to deliver different perception to the user. Why do we need to do this? Because when users complain to you that something takes too long, most probably they relate to the passive phase. Because active phase, due to its mental activity, is not considered a weight at all by the brain. So our task as the developers is to employ some techniques to reduce this passive phase by increasing the active phase of the weights. Um, frankly, I feel myself a bit uncomfortable uh, standing on this stage and uh, talking to such a brilliant audience about such simple things. But when it comes to performance, perception, and brain, it is really that simple. It is really that simple to trick our brain. Let's get to some techniques. There are multiple techniques to manage this balance between the active and passive phase, but all of them boil to two most common ones. The first one being preemptive start. Let's assume you have an event that you want to make your user perceive as a shorter one. In the preemptive start technique, in the beginning of uh, our event, we put the active phase so that user perceives this weight, this event, as the shorter one, just this blue part. Let's get to the example. And I will begin with the offline example that I will never get tired of. In 2009, administration of Houston Airport started getting an enormous amount of complaints on the long baggage handling uh, time. Well, administration decided to help passengers and uh, increase the number of staff on the uh, baggage handling line. That reduced the overall time of the baggage handling to eight minutes. Everybody who travels a lot knows that the time from, you, from the moment you leave the plane to the time you get your bag on the belt, eight minutes is really, really low. Surprisingly enough, the administration didn't notice any decrease in the complaints. So they started investigating this case a bit deeper. And they figured out that indeed, baggage handling time is eight minutes. But the problem is that for an average person to get from the plane to the baggage carousel, it takes only one minute. The remaining seven minutes, the person just stands by the carousel and waits for his bag to show up. Employing the perception management technique, administration came up with a very simple, trivial, but nevertheless very effective solution. What they did, they just started routing the arrival planes to the gates further from the baggage carousel that led to the situation when an average person now needed six minutes to get from the plane to the baggage carousel. And only two minutes just stand and wait. So six minutes of active wait and only two minutes of passive wait. Guess what? The number of complaints dropped to zero. <laughs> Another example, mobile safari on iOS. Uh, it has this feature called uh, preload top hits that is enabled by default in the iOS. Uh, how it works? So you open the browser and you start typing the URL. There are two things to note here. First one, titled top hit. So based on, your, uh, history, on the history of your visits, Safari tries to guess which site you want to visit now. Quite trivial operation. But there is another thing to note here. The network activity. So what happens in this moment? When Safari shows you the top hit site in the background, it also tries to preload this site for you at the same time you type in URL, so that when you're done with the URL, the site is almost instantly here. You don't spend time waiting for all the assets to be downloaded. Another example of preemptive start technique is the site that I'm working with, UniWebNO, and one of the things that we do good is selling domain names. Obviously enough, there has to be the search page for the domains, and it works as any other domain search page in the wild. Users just type in the uh, domain name, 
click go, and they get the results with the domains. The point is that to, get, to build this tree of domains, we need to make an API call that for some technical reasons cannot be stored on the client and cannot be cached. We have different prices, different TLDs, and it all, it's all dynamic. And this API call is not the fastest call in the world. Nevertheless, we don't feel like our users have to be penalized for this. So we start making the API call and preloading all the results and pre-building the DOM tree at the moment the user hits the search page. So user comes to the search page, types in the domain name, and we already have all the DOM tree built in the background. So far, so good. But there are moments when users can search for the domain from another side, uh, sorry, from another page, where he didn't hit the search page. Obviously enough, he doesn't have the search assets yet. Like, for example, on the front page. If you load the front page, you check a network tab, and you see that there are no search-related assets downloaded because you're not on the search page. But let's see what happens when the user focuses on the search field. Once the user is focused in the search field, we, by default, we assume that the next step, the next page he will hit will be the search results page. That's why we immediately start downloading the search assets, make the API call, and start rebuilding the DOM tree right here on the front page before user hits the Go button to deliver the search results as soon as possible when he gets to the search page. This is about preemptive start technique. Another one is called early completion, where we have the same event that we want user to perceive as shorter one, but this time we put active phase at the end of the event. Uh, most probably the most obvious examples of this technique is pretty much any uh, video streaming service like YouTube, for example. It all starts with a passive phase. Users get to the site, click the play button, and they wait for the video to be downloaded. So the original event is full video to be downloaded. But users do not wait until the full video gets to, to their browser in the passive phase all the time. Once the first chunk of the video possible for viewing is downloaded, the, down the video begins and the user is immediately triggered into the active phase because his brain is busy with mental activity analyzing the visual information on his screen, even though the original event keeps going in the background. Let's get to our Gizmodo example and see whether, where do they hide this 20 seconds that we lost. If we check the film strip of rendering process of this site, we will notice that Gizmodo starts rendering the uh, uh, elements as soon as 1.5 seconds, actually a bit earlier, but due to the uh, scale here. And this is the critical moment. Up until there, users are in the passive phase. They have not, no other option rather than just wait. But once the site starts rendering the things, the brain is triggered into the mental activity. This means that user is in active phase and he doesn't mind and he doesn't care how long does it take after this point, whether it's 30 seconds, 40 seconds, to load the rest of the site. He already has information to consume. He can start reading. Today, do not get me wrong, I do not advocate for ignoring the, um, the industrial standards. I just tell you that when users are in passive phase, they're very sad. Seriously, we, are, we all hate waiting. And this is the sweet spot where we want to put our users as soon as possible. And as I said, I do not advocate for ignoring industry standards, industry advices on absolute numbers and all the things. Because, frankly, all, even though I'm telling about perception, all these perception techniques are driven with technical means. So, in order to employ all of this, we still have to load our assets asynchronously. We should not block rendering. We should still keep compressing. Oh, here comes async. Of course, async comes whenever it wants. Uh, we should keep wor using workers, like service workers. Hi, Jake. Um, 
we should keep using resource hints to preload, prefetch resources that we will need on other pages of our site. But instead, what I'm advocating for today is the next time you're working on your performance optimization strategy to use the most powerful and interesting tool available at our disposal, being our brain, and ask yourself a question. Is there any other way to do this? And I couldn't finish my talk better than the quote by Apple in their basic performance tips that says, the perception of performance is just as effective as actual performance in many cases. Thank you. Yes, I hope, I hope my talk didn't keep you in passive wait, but we are looking forward to the active phase that is being launched. <laughs> so a, a quick question, just because well, yes, yes. I, I've got the microphone. Yeah, yeah, sure. Let, uh, so when you're, um, would you Hi, show yeah. content on the screen that is, isn't currently active with JavaScript? Like, would you add stuff visually that isn't yet clickable? And how, how do you sort of cope with that sort of thing? Uh, so the stuff that is not clickable is uh, probably, uh, it depends on the amount of this stuff. If this is the only one button on the screen, obviously users will try to click it and will be disappointed that it's unclickable. But if you have another uh, information to consume, to give user to consume, then I think that it's totally fine to add this element, unclickable, maybe with some tooltip or something that mm. says that, yeah, okay, some more thing is coming. But uh, probably uh, you should, you know, uh, when it comes to performance, every case is quite separate. So you have to analyze and uh, have user testing, whether it works for them or not. But it, I, would, I would not mind putting the unclickable element on the screen as soon as possible, as long as the functionality comes. Makes sense. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you. Uh, so yes, this now takes us to lunchtime. Uh, lunch is just upstairs, if you have a particularly...